Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. You're watching Lantek with Sandeep with one and only Sandeep Das. And in this session today, we're going to cover the Golang basic for DevOps. Uh, in day one, we already covered uh, the overview of Golang, setting up the uh, Golang environment, uh, basic Golang syntax and types, introduction of DevOps and principles, and how Golang fit into the DevOps ecosystem. And in today's session, you're going to cover the variable, constant, data types in details. Then we'll cover the control structure like if, switch, and for loops. And after that, we'll cover the function and packages. And finally, we will cover how Go module works. And I'm super excited to teach you all that. So let's get started. Oh, before that, if you didn't subscribe my channel yet, do please subscribe my channel yet. And since you already done that, let's get started. Now let's deep dive into variable, constant, and data types. So the very first thing, what is variables in Go? So in Go, which often, you know, in terms as Golang, the variables are fundamental unit of storage in a program. Each variable in Go has a specific type which determines the size and the layout of the variable memory and the range of values that can be stored within that memory itself and the set of operation that can be applied to the variable as well. So in simple words, in variable, we store data temporarily so that we can use that data for different operation and different use cases. Now let's learn how we can declare variable. Now in Go, there are many ways to declare variable. And now let me show you that first way. You can use the var keyword. So var name string, which defines the variable name is the type string. Then the next one is that var age int, which is again, you're using the var uh, as the keyword to define the variable, to declare the variable. And the name of the variable is age and the type is int integer. Okay. Now, suppose, I mean, that's one way. Now, second way of that is declaring multiple variables. You can see here, var keyword inside, we are saying that first name, last name as a string, okay, and age as integer. So, another way, right? Third way is that with the value or initializing the variables. So, var name string, again, simply that means var keyword, then after the space, then the name, which is the variable name, then the string, which is the variable type, equals John, okay? And then the second one is that var the var keyword h, which is the variable name, int, which is the variable type, equals 30, the value. So here you can see the, the in the first one, what you have done is that we just define the variable. Okay. In the second one, we shown that how we can define multiple variables. In the third example, we shown while defining the variable, we can assign the values as well, right? Now, in the fourth example, in the fourth example, we can use the type reference. So when you initialize a variable, Go can infer the type based on the value. So Go can automatically detect the type of the variable from its value itself. So for example, say we use your var name is equals to John and the value John is string here, right? So Go will automatically type infer as a string for the particular variable name. Similar way, see here we have uh, given assign the value or initialize the value var age is equals to 30. And the value 30 is a number or integer, right? So Go will automatically type in for of the particular age variable as an integer. So Go can do that. Now, in the point five, you can see short variable declaration. And here, this is shorthand, colon equals, okay? And here, uh, Go can, of course, can automatic data type detection of a variable. And here, you don't actually have to use the word keyword simply the variable name which is name age uh, address whatever it is okay you can simply say then give colon equals then the value and based on the value go will automatically detect the variable data type so these are the different ways you can define variables in go now let me start from zero oh i mean zero values so what exactly is zero values in Go? So in Go, variable declared without any explicit or any initial value are given the zero value. So for any numeric uh, variable that you this is declared, that will have a by default zero value, zero. And if you define any variable as Boolean, the value will be false by default. 
and if you declare any string the value will be empty string which is in we, we show in in uh, quotes but this empty string okay let me quickly show you uh, as a demo uh, very quick and then we'll proceed to other things okay now for this particular day two all the codes are actually moved to this day two folder in our git repo and out of that just find out the zero values file okay now let me switch back to the coding where i can explain in a better or easy way and you can run it now let's look into this zero underscore values dot go file so in the main you can see that var y is integer var z is boolean variable a is string and var, uh, variable uh, bb is a pointer of integer now let's quickly print and find out what will be the value it will print uh, if you just run this go file let's just run go run then the zero values okay and let's see what we, it is print so okay here it printed for y the value is zero because as we previously learned for integer it will be the zero uh, by default if we don't assign any value for z which is a boolean it is the value is false for a variable which is string type the value is like blank value or blank string uh, then bb is a, not an integer but a pointer or the address pointer of a integer which is that's why nil not a zero value okay now let's learn about the constants so what is the constant constant are declared like variables but with the const keyword and not the word keyword okay and constant can be character can be string can be boolean or numeric value but constant value cannot change as the name itself is constant right let me quickly show a demo to you so here in the constant.go file you will see inside main we are defining a constant variable as const the keyword is a const here c o n s t space the variable name here is pi or you can it can be any value or any variable name that you assign here okay equal to the value now remember the value that you assign to the constant once it cannot be changed for now let's just print out this value okay so let's run go run then constant dot go and we'll print pi is equal to 3.14 now what if we try to change the value of pi or change the value of a constant so just uncomment this line pi is equal to 400 and if we try to run this go file it's simply saying cannot assign the value to pi because we define the pi variable as a constant not as a variable or not as a dynamic variable right so we cannot change the value of a constant okay now let's learn about the variable types so there are two kind of variable types which is the basic types and composite type under basic types there is integer float 64 string bool and all that in composite types we have array struct pointer slice map channel interface etc okay now let's deep dive into it our first basic type is integers and under integers there is three type kind of integers which is sign integers that is int 8 16 int 32 int 64 and int which size is from uh, either 32 or 64 bits depend on the platform then uh, second one is the unsigned integer which is uh, uint 8 or byte uint 16 uint 32 uint 64 and you win again which size depend on the platform okay and the third one that is a machine dependent types where it's int you win you win pointer and their size depend on the type of architecture of the program that is running on based on its 32 bit or 64 bit now let me show you an example then it will be much more clear to you guys so now if you come to this integers.go file there is you can see the signed integers example which is a int 8 is equal to 127 which is range from uh like usually want minus 128 to plus 127 and in 6 which is the value can range from uh negative 32768 to positive 32767 and other uh, unit examples are there and we we'll print their values now in under unsigned integers you can see the verse c u int 8 is equals to 255 and for that the value can range from 0 to 255 and there is word d u int 16 which is the variable name is d and the type of the uh, variable is u int 16 
uh, equals to 65,535, which is like value can range from 0 to 65,535. And then there is machine dependent uh, types, uh, which is as you can see about E is equal to int, then this size depends on the architecture. When you run, you will see the values. Uh, then uh, F is equal to U, U int, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and then again, the value you will see based on the system architecture. And then G is equal to U int pointer, and it's 0, X, and that random value, okay? Now let's print this value, let's just run it. So go run, then integers let's go so of course for a int 8 187 is valid it will print uh for you b int 16 it will print a uh, negative 326 for unsigned also it will print the values properly so these are the ways you can define different different type of integers in your go programs now let's learn about the second basic type which is the floating point numbers so in floating point you have float 32 and float 64 and uh, this represents the real numbers so float 32 is single precision floating point and float 64 is double precision uh, floating point okay and there is a third type which is the complex numbers okay and complex 64 and complex 128 and this used for uh, complex numbers now complex 64 uses floor 32 for real and imaginary parts while complex 128 uses the floor 64 now let me show you a combined example as a hands-on demo okay so we'll find the float example in float.go and in this particular file we'll see we are defining float values and complex values let's just uh, complete the example with the float value itself okay so in the float you'll see var h then uh, we given the variable type as float 32 equals 3.14 and var i that we have given the variable type as float 64 is equals to 3.14 and then some long random number. Now this 32 represents the 32 bit which is the 4 byte of data it can store and 64 which is actually 8 byte of data it can store. Now let's just first print as it is okay and let's see. So go run then the float.go okay and if you see it store i mean it uh, printed 3.14 as we as just defined here okay the values now what if we try to ask add random random values okay and if you see that let's try to print it it will not print all the values because it cannot store all the value it can store up to 3.140972 okay so how to around this okay and let's just make it back like how it was and for float 64 let's again just try to add different different values okay like random values and now let's again print and you will see it can store up to like 974 some some random values okay so as per the variable definition or as per the type 32 or 64 it can store a particular uh, up to 4 byte or 8 byte of data right after that it cannot store okay that is the the meaning here and same goes for the complex number as well now let's learn about the booleans and the word bool or the keyword bool represents the boolean and the bool or the boolean represents true or false now let me quickly show a demo and it will be very clear after that so in the quotes just find the boolean uh, dot go file so it will be here in the very top and you can see uh, L is equal to uh, bull, uh, say var, then space L, then space bull, which is defining this L variable as boolean equals true, the default value is true. And similarly, we can also say var m, then uh, space bull is equal to false. And here we are defining two boolean values with one true and one false. Let's just quickly print it. So to the, do that, just run using go run boolean dot go. And you can see it will print uh, L is equals to that uh, true and M is equals to false. Okay. So this is how you can define Boolean variables in Go. Now let's learn about the string. Okay. And uh, the st string represents a sequence of character. And strings in Go are immutable. Okay. And uh, we can define the string using var, then the variable name here n, then space string. And this is and, and you can give the like equals to any value if you want to initialize in the same line as you're defining the variable as well and let me quickly show you 
uh, in the in the code so that will be easier to understand for you guys just find the file called string dot go here okay and you can see just the uh, particular uh, word the keyword then space n the variable name and then space the string keyword and this is how we can define the um, string variable and equals then the default value now this is one way of course you can do another way as well say n then equals then hello world which will be exact same thing okay if you want to use it that way it will also work just to be double sure okay now let's uh, quickly print it so go run then the string dot go and see it is print n is equal to hello world again just to show you uh previous one also will work like both way works okay so you can like for any variable definition as in the beginning i've covered you can define either way so this is how you can define a string variable in go now let's start learning about the composite types and the first composite type we're going to cover are the arrays now what are arrays in go so an array has a fixed size defined at compile time uh, for example var a then in third brackets 5 int declare an array of 5 integers okay and you can see uh, in another uh, here in the screen also var o with the variable name then in third brackets we're giving 5 and then int that means it's 5 integer then equals again uh, we're giving uh, the third brackets inside the 5 then int and then we're assigning the values right so this is how we are assigning five integers value into the array okay now enough talk let me show you in the code with the hands-on okay now let's just code the code and search with a file called arrays on the top it will top yeah arrays.go okay in this array.go you will see uh the uh, that's the the variable that you talked var we are defining like we are first giving the keyword var then the variable name here the variable name is o then uh in third brackets we're giving five and then the data type is integer okay and equals to we are assigning the value that's again in third bias 5 int the five integer values and here we are giving the values now let's just print with this one okay first huh? let's go clear the thing. go run and then this array dot go and we'll print the like o is equal to the all the values okay it will show now what if we give uh like four values not five values okay let's see and if you try to run it it will just run see since we didn't give uh, the fifth value by default it will become zero you remember the zero values concept we uh, covered now what if instead of uh, say giving the like not removing the value we try with the four and then we try to run it'll throw array because we say it's four integer array but we are supplying five values it will not allow because it's a fixed type fixed number of items right so it has to match the item that you're going to supply here so if you're saying it's five integers that means it will have five fixed items or five fixed values and it has to be integer what if we try to give a string here okay say test okay and if we try to do run it no cannot use test untyped string constant as integer value in array or slice integer so it's saying that we're expecting an integer why the hell you're giving me a string here that's why it's throwing error so this is a fine example of how to define an array and how to assign value to an array in go now let's learn about the slices or we can call it a dynamic size array kind of kind of dynamic size array okay now slices are similar to array but their size can change okay and they are more flexible and are used more often than the arrays okay now example wise you can see here that p and we are, we are using shorthand okay so p colon equals then again very minorly focus that part here we are not giving any fixed number we are just opening third packets and closing third packets then int and inside that just like any we are giving some values okay now here it's dynamic because we didn't assign any fixed value that's what the difference between array in go where you are giving fixed number of uh items or number that this much number can be exist in this particular uh array 
if we don't want to kind of have a fixed array instead kind of array or say a slice here where the number of items can be anything as many as you want or as low as you want then it has to be a dynamic size um, slices okay and in that we should not mention the number of items now let me show a quick demo which will make your concept more clear now for the slices go to slice.go okay now let's just quick a quick uh, reference what is the difference here in the array you are giving inside like this is how you're defining or just you can you can ignore that part as well you can just focus this part inside this opening and closing of third brackets you're giving a number but if you come to this slice okay slice.go here that here you are not giving any number okay any uh, you're not assigning any particular fixed number and you can add as many as item you want and will not throw any uh, error okay because in array.go we had given getting this error right index out of uh, bound error right but here because you're not fixing or you're we are not uh, giving any fixed number of items you're not doing that way it will not throw error and we're calling it a slice let me quickly run it so you will have more idea so go run slice dot go see it's printing like that now what if we add an item so let's say six or just go ahead and seven let's just run it and we'll print one two three four five six seven and what if we uh, just remove any item say we are removing four five six seven previously it was one two three four five right now just run it and run that go run slice right it's just working as it is right here the only difference between array and slice is that in array you have fixed number right and in slice you don't have a fixed number here okay that's the only thing and that's the only difference it's making but what if you just add a new as a string value okay and try to print it it will not allow because you are saying it's a slice of integers that means you cannot have a slice slice of integers a string value you can add any number as you want but it cannot be a string value okay so this is how we define and use slices in go now let's learn about the structs and it's very important focus so a struct is kind of a custom type okay so struct are used to create custom type or custom data type with mixed data types okay for example a type person now type person and you can think attributes of that person what could be the attributes a person could be name a person attribute could be uh, age a person attribute could be address uh, we can add bank account other details but for now let's keep it so think about we are creating a new data type called person and person have some meaningful attributes such as name age address and we're adding that now name is string right age it cannot be string it has to be an integer so that's why we are creating a new custom data type and you're adding attributes which have different different kind of values or different different data types uh, for each attribute so this is what we call struct let me show a quick demo it will become a much more clear to you guys so the struct example you have to find in struct.go and this file you'll see we have defined exactly the same variable that we just uh, see in the slide so type then type we're, we're getting custom type right so that's why you're using the keyword called type then space the name of the type that you're creating which is person then the keyword struct we are structuring the attributes inside that and inside that we are giving two attribute one is the name uh, the name string and the second one is the age which is integer now we have created our new custom data type which is all fine we are getting new data structure now we want to use it right so how you use it see the example here we are now now this is the data type we have created a new data type a custom data type now we are creating a variable and so var the var keyword you're using then q okay the variable name then person person is what for example for string we use what we use string for integer we was integer but since we've created the custom data type this type uh, then person so here the data type is person and we are using the same data type here person equals to then we are assigning value so person equals to person then in that we are adding the attribute values so uh, first attribute that is the uh, name and the second attribute is 30 so that's how we are getting a 
Q variable which is generated by this person and you are supplying the, the required values also. Now, how we can then access this internal fields or these attributes? Let me show you. So here if you see, suppose I want to access the that P variable, that variable's name. Okay. So how can I access it? So the variable name was Q, right? So Q dot name. Now I want to act, suppose I want to access the age, same way, Q then dot age. So this is how we can access the attributes of this struct or custom struct. So in our talk, let me quickly run it and uh, show you. So run go, run struct and see. Yes. See if we print the Q, it printing the data structure. I mean, not data structure, the, the value that you assigned. So Alice and 30, right? Which represents the name and the age. Then as you wanted to get the name, so we had to use the Q, which is the variable name, then dot name, which is the attribute name. That is Alice. So name equals to name equals to Alice. Same for the second attribute that is age. So Q dot age, Q again is the variable name, not the Red type name. Don't make this mistake. People do make me that mistake. Don't do that. It's the variable that you create from that you derive the value. So Q dot H and you'll have the value called 30 because while creating this Q variable, you use the custom data type person, but while creating the, I mean, while uh, giving that person uh, data type, you give it two values, right? Alice, which is the name and H, which is 30, right? So that is why in Q, you have this value stored under name and age. Okay. And that's how it printed here. So this is how custom data type or struct work in Go. Easy, isn't it? Now let's move to the next one. Now let's learn about the maps. Okay. So what a map? In short, it says that key value pairs. So maps are used to store data in key value pairs. For example, map inside third packet string, then outside that int is a map with string keys and integer values. Okay, so that's how we map the key values. So you can see an example also here that R then uh, colon equals, which is shorthand by the way, map then in third brackets, we're giving string. So string is the name of the key. Okay, then outside of that third bracket, we are saying int, that is an integer. That means the values are going to be integer. Okay, so here that's how we're defining and you see we're passing values like how? then third brackets after that, then Alice, which is what? String, as you mentioned here, and the, uh, the, the value is what? 30, right? So this is how we can create a key value pair or map in Go. Now let me quickly run the code and show you a quick demo. Okay, so let's run a demo quickly. The map example you'll find in map.go file. And here we are doing exact same example that I have just shown you in the slide. So uh, variable R, equals to map, then in the map, we have to say what will be the keys data type, which is string here, and will be the values data type, which is int here, okay? Here also, we are, while defining the variable r as a map, we are also passing some values, okay? So here, we are passing Alice and Bob. Now, Alice is the key, and the value is 30. Bob is the key, and the value is 25. Now, how can you access then the value of Alice or value of Bob, which is here? So we have to use the variable here r and then give third brackets and inside that with double quotes we have to specify the key name which is here alice and same goes for the bob now let's quickly run this script and see what value it prints so go run and this map.go and it's printing r is equal to map then uh, the values are alice and bob 25 now uh, what is the value of alice which is Alice equal 30. What is the value of Bob? Which is the Bob key and the value is 25. And here it printed the Bob is equal to 25. Now, what if uh, while assigning values, instead of integer, we use the maybe string. Let's see how it will react or how it will error. So some uh, say test value. Okay. And let's try to run it. And it will give you error saying test val type string constant. So we're saying that we're expecting an integer here. Why are you giving a like string value? So that's why it's throwing error. Again, if you give any integer value, so say 30, for example, it was like previously, it will work. Okay. So this is how we can use map variable in Go. Let's move to the next one. Now, 
let's understand a very very important topic of go which is pointers okay now what is pointers so pointer holds the memory address of a variable for example var p then star int is a pointer to an integer okay so for example you can see in this uh, this screen here var s then uh, the variable s data type is int equal to 10 and var t uh, then star int equal to and s now the and operator here is used to retrieve the memory address of s okay and t while defining uh, the variable t t star int that means t is actually declared as a pointer of an integer okay that's how we can store a memory address of s right now let me show a quick example in the coding it will make clear everything all our doubts will be clear let me show you quickly the pointer example will find in pointers at go and in the pointer real example at go first let me give a basic example and then we'll move to the better example so in this basic pointer example uh, you will see var s int that means it's a integer variable s we are assigning the value 10 then var t int so t is declared as a pointer reference of integer equals to then we have to assign a variable and we can assign a only variable memory reference or pointer reference because we are defining a pointer here so that means we have to give a value which is a pointer value right so to do that we are using and and operator is used to get the memory address of a variable so and s so it's getting the memory address of s and now if we print s it will print 10 if we print t now t is what memory uh, as a pointer a memory address uh, of an integer right so that will uh, point the memory address of what what value assigned of s so me memory pointer or memory address of s will print and if we want to get a value of uh, t or say exact like, this is memory pointer right now suppose we want to get the value of s the main value okay not the memory address we can get that by using star t let me show it in action it will be make much clear and then after the real example it will become very very clear so let's just run it simply run go run pointers dot go and see it's been what s is equals to 10 t is equals to memory address of s okay this is memory address then star t which is no more pointing to the memory address but is actually fetching the value which is 10 so this is the basic example of the pointers now let me show you the real usage of pointer like it will it should be coming to a question like what is the use of this it's a very very huge use case the main use case i will tell you like while passing the variable to different functions okay there you should not just pass the main value why not just pass the memory address and then in the function you just get the value of that particular uh, that particular variable just using pointer reference then you don't actually have to pass big big values and that make your application performance to the top now uh, let me show you a quick real example it will clear all your doubts so here we have a custom data type as employee by now you know what is a custom data type is so type employee the custom data type structure is name position and salary name is a string position is string salary is float now we create a function called function update salary here we are passing the emp then uh, the the pointer reference new salary which is float 64 now uh, emp again just as a repeat emp is a uh, in this parameter variable emp what is the data of emp which is star employee star employee of what star employee like this this is the so emp means emp is a pointer reference uh, variable which is referring to the uh, memory pointer of employee okay this is how you are defining the data type new salary new salary data is what called float 64 now in this function what are doing here so we are updating the salary so emp the whatever uh, structure supplied here salary is equals to new salary okay now let's see the actual flow what's going on here so first you are defining a emp variable and the variable is what is the data type we are using shorthand just employee data type go will automatically uh, you know infer that so employee 
and in employee what are the attributes we had we had name we had position we had salary that we are supplying here so name john Deere, position software developer and salary fifty thousand. okay now what you're doing you're printing before the initial update and we are uh, updating that and then after update we are printing now importantly see and use it for what and is used to fetch the memory address of emp uh, variable right this is the way you are not supplying the exact uh, value or exact the all the all the values here you're just passing the difference right and while coming to the function uh, here it is getting the enter value and is updating the value and it's not updating the value just here it's updating the value of the source also that is why when you're printing here uh, the uh, this uh, after update emp it's in the actual original variable as well not just the parameter variable but original source variable as well so this is how it used let's just run it and, and show you how it works so go run and that pointer example pointer real life example <laughs> okay and see the magic uh, before update the value was john do the name software developer the position and the fifty thousand salary was the uh, salary right now and what we passed we passed is that uh, this reference we passed okay with add here and after that after the update see original variable emp that value is changed to what 60,000 now if you go to the function see what is the value we supplied a new salary whatever the variable is passing you're updating that right and in the uh, this function update salary then and the emp which is the uh, employee reference 60,000 the salary wanted what 60,000 and that is what updated in the original emp variable using the help of the pointer so this is the real usage of pointer by now i hope you understand okay now let's learn about the channels or in uh, most common term it's called go routine communication now channel r used for communication between go routines or concurrent threads and they can be synchronous or asynchronous and how can we define a channel variable so for that use the variable name for example u and then shorthand and equals use the keyword called make and in the first brackets say chan chan in short channel right so chan then the data type that you're handling so integer it could be custom data it could be anything now let me show you a quick example and a real life example it will be somewhat clear and in the future sessions we'll go very deep dive into this okay so don't worry just quickly cover a overview example with that the channel example we'll find in two files First in the channel.go and second in the real life exam, that is channel underscore real example. So let's just uh, go with the channel.go. Now in the channel.go file, you will see how you're defining a channel uh, variable. So you, then the shorthand of way of declaring, then make, then in the uh, first brackets, then chan, chan keyword to define as a channel, and then int. So it's, it's what? It's an unbuffered channel of integers, okay? And it's just doing that I'm printing you so that you know what it's in this u it's kind of a memory point reference right just run this so go run and this channel dot go and see it prints a memory address okay now this alone can't make this clear so to make it clear why not i show you a real example just try to understand it i'm not seeing you understand completely as in the future session we'll go very deep dive just try to understand as much as you can okay here now, here in this particular example, uh, we are using a time package from FMT, you know, it's just for printing the logs uh, uh, in the uh, CLI and the uh, time is just to get the time uh, and we can use some function with this time. Okay. Now, first thing you're doing is that we are defining a order. Okay. And this, this order is a custom type. So type, then it is to declare the custom types, then uh, order. So, and uh, the structure is what? ID, which is integer, status, which is string, okay? And then we're defining a function and this is where the magic happening, okay? In this function process order, uh, it's uh, expecting uh, two parameters. First one is order ID, which is the type, data type is integer. And second one is the status channel, which is the, um, the data type is uh, chan order. Now, chan is for what? Chan is for channel, okay? So status channel, chan order. So in this is expecting the order channel. Okay. See, so look at very carefully. Chan 
which is channel order is the this particular custom type so and what is doing is that it's just stop like sleeping so it's just so stopping the process for two seconds okay so it would do what in status channel we are assigning the value that order which is a custom type here and there we are passing id then the order id that what we are passing here and then the status is completed okay now let's check the main flow then this entire scene will become more clear to you guys okay so first thing here okay we are creating a status channel okay and this status channel is what a channel right so status channel uh, equals uh, then make this used to make a custom channel so uh, uh, make then chan and what is the data type uh, of of say we're creating a channel of what data type so it's a channel of order data okay so chan order is order data and order is or variable is what you know id and status right so in status channel we are uh, creating a uh, like for order data okay now we are running five uh, loops so for i is equals to uh, one then i less than five so it's just running the loops of five times okay because it's less than equals five right okay and if you see here it's creating what is creating five channels by the way so go then process order so process order and then uh, i i is what I is the one, two, three, four, five, and what addition we are passing? We are passing the status channel. In this status channel, we have the value stored for all order ID. Okay, so how we are passing is that order ID is what one, two, whatever value we are passing, and the status complete. So this is how we can track the values, and we can run everything concurrently. Okay, so if we go down, and then and after this loop, we are printing the status of the values. So we will understand. Uh, which process early and which process letting we will understand all that okay just run this go run and the channel underscore real life example you will see it taking some time it's fine now see the order here it is not actually one two three four five but what order four completed fast then order one then order five then order three and then order two right so how this happens because it is waiting for the order to be processed, the data to be processed, and uh, it can happen in any uh, order because it's all concurrently happening. And then at the end, we're just using this particular loop to just printing all the uh, statuses here, okay? That's why in the process order, you are seeing this uh, order four process completed, order one process completed, order five process completed, and order uh, three, two, like that way, okay? So this is how we use the core routines to handle multiple orders concurrently and use channel to communicate the status of the order data okay now don't worry if you find it uh, is a bit difficult because in our upcoming session we'll go very deep dive into this okay now let's move to the next one okay now learn that function can be also used as a variable how let's find it out so function can be assigned to a different variables uh, you can see this example so let's quickly run that and understand how it works okay so let's go to the jump into the code and if you see the function as the file name is the function as variable dot go okay and if you see there first we are defining a variable okay so var v var v is a what variable and what kind of variable func so function variable and what it expects as an input it expect input as an integer and then uh, what it's returning? What should you, you should expect as a return value? The return value is actually an integer. So where v uh, is a function that accept integer and return integer. And now this is just a variable definition. So what about the value? Okay. So v is equals to a function. Now you are defining a function. So v is equals to a function. Again, what was the input? It will be the input as integer. So variable again x int. So the variable input should be x integer. And uh, what should be the output? Output again should be integer. Okay. That is why int. And what is the is function is doing? So function is returning x into x. So it's just multiplying the value that is getting as input. So uh, for example, what? If you put 2, it will be 4. If you put 4, it will be 8. If you put 5, it will be 25. Right. So in the result variable, we're just simply storing the value that is v 
then it's actually usage also okay so v then uh, we, as an input we are supplying what 5 so it should return what 5 into 5 25 so and that value actually getting stored in the result variable which is what integer because go will automatically detect the uh, return type and assign that data type to the result variable okay so now if we print uh, the result variable it should print the 25 value so just quickly run it and see how it uh, what is expecting to return so go run and then use the function as variable and if you run that you see it's printing 25 okay i hope that you find this one very interesting and if you find this one very interesting many such interesting topics coming up so just move to the next one now let's learn about one of the very interesting uh, topic called interface types or method sets whatever you call it so interfaces define set of methods okay a type implements an interface by implementing its methods and they are central to go's type system and polymorphism so this is how you can achieve a polymorphism in go let me show by example then it will be more clear to you guys the interface example we'll find in the uh, code as interface.go now let's understand the interface.go uh, file first and then i will explain how it's working okay so in this interface.go file uh, we are importing of course the package main and the import uh, we are importing the fmd which is to show the logs in the cli now importantly first thing is type geometry interface now this is the interface keyword you're using it type geometry it is a custom type we are defining but it's not struct see we are not using struct instead of struct we are calling it as an interface okay and interface to what area which is float 64 and perimeter which is the float 64 now this area and this perimeter and after that we are giving float 64 and this is the return data type okay now interface is what it defines the set of methods so here you are uh, setting the set of methods like area and parameter and after that we are seeing what is the return data type the return data type is float 64 okay so now let's go to the next line okay this is the data type so type rect which is rectangular rect struct this is a custom data type where here what are the attributes right so attributes are width height and for width and height both data are float 64 data type okay or in short float data type now we are defining two functions like this area and perimeter these are two methods or function right we are uh, using here so that means that has to be defined and that's why we are defining here now look at the definition very carefully func which is the way to define function func in func as input we are expecting r and r is what r is r data type is rect rect is what rect is a structure uh, custom data type where we are expecting width and height two parameters okay with flow 64 data so r where uh, the data input is a rectangular or r custom data type and the function name is what area the function name is area and what is the return type of this uh, function uh, area is float 64 and what that function does it returns the r width so r uh, this particular uh, variable width into r height into the second attribute height this all it does okay then the second function is again same definition the parameter inside the function we're expecting uh, as r rect which is the custom data type rect then the function name uh, perimeter and uh, the what is the return data type is the float 64 and what this function doing it just returning return 2 into then uh, in the first brackets r width plus r height this is the perimeter data simply return and in the main flow watch that very carefully because this is where the magic happening var w so var w w is the variable of what this is the interface so var w geometry and uh, geometry is what geometry is the interface type right so we are defining a variable which is type is a interface and that interface that, that's what it's in the area and parameter and in, in the area and parameter what is it's expecting as input as rect okay this is the custom data type here so var w 
geometry is interface explaining data type which is rect rect and what is the rect uh, inside rect we are expecting in the rect structure as a custom data type we are expecting width and height so we are supplying that in rect the data type uh, we are expecting 3 and 4 these two data we are expecting here right and after you pass the data you can then utilize the methods like what is the area and what is the parameter and the how to access that so use w which is the uh, variable uh, geometry geometry is what the interface so w then dot area if you want to access this function or use this particular function or method you have to use dot so w dot area and this is how we call it and uh, if you want to use the second function parameter same way w dot uh, parameter and calling the function and since the value that you've already passed here okay in the rect 3 4 it already have the value so, and these two function already also have the value okay this is why this polymorphism uh, is coming here okay and if you run this particular code you will see it's giving the proper value so just run it so go run and this interface dot interface dot go and see w is what if you print the w is printing the data only three and four okay because that's what you assigned here but it's implement it's, it's implementing or it's an interface right so that's why you have the additional methods available which is what which is why you are able to access so if you print the w it's not actually printing the methods here. instead it's imprint uh, it's printing the value that you're assigning here okay but it has access to different these two functions area and parameter that's why when you're calling these two is giving you 12 which is uh, 3 into 4 uh, 12 and uh, the parameter where it's uh, 2 into uh, 3 plus uh, 4 right so which is why 14 so this is how our interface work now let's learn about the type analysis okay or custom name for existing data types it is useful for readability or when transitioning code for example type byte size there is a now here using the type word and you know why use the type word, right the we use the type keyword when we are going to create a new custom data type so here what you using use type then space the data type that you want to name or the the name that you want of the particular data type then space the actual data type that you want to replace with or you want to just create a reference or alias for example type byte size in 64 so it's creating an alias of in 64 into the byte size this is a custom name or custom data type that you're creating so next time when you uh, suppose want to uh, assign a value or create a variable for a uh, byte uh, in 64 you just have to use word then the variable name for example in this example you see x then the uh, byte size you don't have to mention the in 64 because because you created the allies right let me show you very quickly then it will start making sense for you okay and the file name for this example is type underscore allies dot go if you go there same example type which is uh, this keyword used to create custom data uh, custom data type which is byte size and what is this referring to or is alias of in 64 and we are going to use the uh, byte, uh, byte size which is var then x and what is that x is uh, byte size which is the data type of uh, x byte size and byte size referring to what this integer 64 if you go here see it's uh, hovering on the hovering you will see anyway uh, equal to value of 1024 now let's see if it works or not so go run then type alias and see it's print 1024 that, that works right now that we have covered the data types it's time to start learning about the control structure and these control structures are if statement switch statement and for loops let's get started Let's learn if statement first. So the if statement in Go used for conditional execution of code blocks. It can optionally include an else block for alternate execution when the if condition is not met. Now let me show you practical and it will become much more clear. The if example will find in if underscore example dot go file here. And you know the, the basic starting package main import format for log printing and all inside main function will be having that 
Now, here, first we're defining a variable x with integer type value as 10. And uh, the first condition using if I'm checking, if x is greater than 5. If x is greater than 5, it will print x is greater than 5. Very simple, isn't it? Now, just let's run it and see what will print. So, go run then if example. And it will print x is greater than 5. But what if x x less than uh, less than 5? If you do that, this condition is not succeeding, right? So, it will not print uh, like x is greater than 5 or anything like that. Because the condition is not succeeding. Okay, let's again move back to x is greater than 5. Then only it's printing x is greater than 5. So if the condition success, and then if you want to run some code, then this if conditional works perfectly like that. Okay, and here syntax wise, you have to use the keyword if, then uh, space, then give the condition. So x is greater than 5 or less than 5 or whatever the condition is. And then in, uh, in second bracket, uh, opening and closing inside the, that is a code block. There you put your all your logic there. Okay. Now, this is if the condition success. But what if you just, uh, if the condition doesn't success, in that case, if you want to run some code, for that you have this particular code called if and else. Okay. This code block. So, as per this code block, if you uh, see here, if x is greater than 5, then it will print x is greater than 5. But if x is not greater than 5, it will simply print the x is not greater than 5. Previously, it was not there, right? Else block. So in the else block, uh, if the condition doesn't match, and then if you want to run some logic, some code, uh, in that case, you use the else statement. So syntax-wise, uh, the keyword if, and then the condition, then in uh, second brackets, you put all your uh, the logic that you want if the condition matches. And in the else block, you put the code block or uh, put the logic. If the condition doesn't match, then what are the codes going to run? Okay, this is what the if else look like. So let's run it. You can see, just go run and then see. It's saying that x is greater than 5. Now, if, say I'm putting x as 4 and then run it, it'll say, it will come to the else block. Okay, it will say x is not greater than 5. So that's how this works. Okay, now let's disable this and look at this one. So in this condition, if you see, it's if else, if else. So you have one condition that is fine, but what if you have more conditions? So for example, you are checking x is greater than 10. If not, is x equals equals 10? If not, then x is less than 10, right? So for example, right now the value is what? 4. So let's put it 10. So in the condition matching, it's like if x is greater than 10, but x value is what? 10, not greater than 10, isn't it? So if you run it, it will print x is exactly 10. So it's first is checking x is greater than 10 or not, which is not. x actually is uh, 10, which is, um, so x, x is greater than 10, right? Uh, not 10. So that's why it's coming to else, else block and with else itself, else if. So else if, then if statement checking x equal equal 10 or not. And yes, it's that's why it is coming to this code block and it's printing x is exactly 10. Now, what if I put it as a uh, 14, for example, and run this code, you'll see it will print x is greater than this. It's matching the first condition itself. Now, what if I put x as 4, then you'll see it will come to the else block. So first condition is checking x is greater than 10 or not, which is not. So it will not match. It will not execute this code. Then Else, if it's checking x is equal to equal 10, which is not again, so it will not come to this code block. And in the else block, I'm not checking any condition. So it's by default action, okay? By default, it's going to run anyway. If no condition match, then this code block will run, which is x is less than 10. So if we run now, we'll say x is less than 10. This is how if, if, else, if, else, this condition works, okay? So this is one. And the, finally, you have this one. So with initializing statement, so you see that uh, x we are assigning here, right? But what if like in the if statement itself, if you want to uh, assign some value or get some value from somewhere and then do the condition, you can do that. The only thing that you should notice here, y is not accessible out of this code. So let's just run it and see 
in the same condition in the same if you are saying if y equals 20 so y's value is 20 and y greater than 10 then we will say y is greater than 10 this will just simply this code block will work if y's value is greater than uh, 10 okay so let's run it okay uh, x okay the, if you uh, in go if you declare a variable and you don't use it they give you this egg declare not used so let's just uh, comment out this code as well and just run again and say x is greater than 10 so x if you just put instead of 20 as 2 and we run it it will not print anything because there is no else statement so if we add else and then add it say that y is less than less than 10 then only it will work again see x is less than 10 and for example we want to print y's value outside of this this it will not work it will give you error so let's just print it and say i want to just print y value and it will just say no undefined y because y's scope is actually inside this block only this if block it's not accessible outside if you define the variable inside a if statement that is one thing you must always remember okay now this is all about the if statement now let's learn about the switch statement so what are the switch statements the switch statement in go is used for multiple conditional executions and it's a cleaner way to write a sequence of if else if statements now let me show you how switch statement works in go so the switch example will be in switch underscore example dot go file and we'll start with the basic switch statement okay so here uh, we are uh, taking one variable called day and the value is integer 3 and you're using switch statement now to use a switch statement you have to use the keyword called switch and then the value upon you are using the condition or you're checking the or you're doing the switch casing okay so switch then the variable that you're using for the switch case checking is day so day is what three so switch day and then all this conditional coming of course the code block is starting with the second bracket and ending with the second bracket okay make sure that now switch then the variable now if the variable is one so here the conditional match happens with the statement called case so if the day is one then it's monday if the day is two then it's tuesday then if the day is uh, three then it's wednesday if the day is uh, four then thursday if the day is five then it's friday if the day is six then it's saturday and if the day is seven that means it's sunday and if nothing say we, we're just uh, not giving any value or any invalid value it will show invalid day so just simply run the code and see simply run go run and switch statement you see it printed wednesday now what if i give an invalid day so it will not match any case so the when the switch statement try to match the day value with all the case so it will the day value will be matched against one two three four and if nothing match it will come to the default statement or default uh, code execution here okay which you call invalid day so let's put nine for example and if you try to run the code it will come to this invalid day again if you give any any valid value between seven and uh, uh, one to seven for example six then it will put if you run the code it's saying saturday so this is how the switch statement works switch match the variable value against the cases cases value so day then case one that means day is equals equals one and this is the condition if the day equal equals uh, two then this is the code that's going to get executed this is how the switch statement works basic level okay now let me show you another use case of switch statement so let's learn switch statement with initialization so if you see here we're using switch then the variable is today and while uh, using the switch statement we are assigning the values as well so in the same statement switch then the variable today we are giving the value of today also the same statement see switch today then the value is time now weekly so it's, it's getting the weekday value and 
today okay then the condition case if the time saturday and sunday then this is weekend if this is not saturday and sunday it's saying it's a weekday now i'm recording on weekend so it must show the weekend so let's just run it and see it's saying it's the weekend because it's today the weekend and i'm recording the video and for this time we imported the time model okay so now you see it's automatically uh, so in this switch initialization in the same switch statement we give the value and then we use that value as per switch case statement okay so this is how and also another thing you should notice that case then we use two condition either of this either saturday or sunday then this code will execute otherwise it will say it's a weekend so we can use multiple statements or multiple condition in the case as well that's another thing to learn okay let's just comment it down the final case here where the switch without a condition like if else okay so we are giving uh, we're using x as a variable so x uh, then equals 42 so x variable uh, the type is integer it will automatically infer okay 42 then see the thing switch and we're not giving any value here okay so we're saying switch then case x get less than zero then x is negative case x equal equal zero then x is zero then default if like x uh, like x is positive so which, which simply means that uh, condition are not matching so if the condition uh, if uh, else if then this is a condition and nothing match so final else this is this so just using switch as a if else statement right so the first value it's coming x less than 0 now x is 42 it is not less than 0 so it is x is not negative second case x equal equal 0 so no, which is not so x is actually 42 so and x is uh, not uh, 0 so let's say x is not zero. So this code block will not execute and default which is no condition matching so it will run anyway and uh, it will run the x is positive just run it and see it will print x is positive so these are the different different ways you can utilize the switch statement in go now let's learn about the loops so go has only one looping construct the for loop now it can be used in various way to implement looping functionality and we'll be covering each of the loop use case the loops example file will find in for loops example.go file and we're going to cover all the loop cases right so let's check out the basic for loop okay and if you see here we are using the for keyword so for then you are using the uh, i equals zero then i less than five i plus plus which ultimately means that i is, is a i is a variable i's initial value is zero so it will start from zero then i will run till less than five from so zero one two three four five five times this loop will run and it will increment one by one so i plus plus which is i it will increment one by one by one okay and inside the for loop what will do it will just print the i so zero one two three like that it will keep printing till the five so less than five is up it will print up to four so zero to four which is five okay so let me quickly run it and show you this the screen first so go run for loop example okay and see it looks like basic uh, for loop 0 1 2 uh, 3 4 like this okay now let's comment it down and let's see how can you utilize the for loop as a while loop so again we use the i variable so i equals 0 so then we run for i less than 5 so we are running for loop as a while loop so for i less than 5 so it will run until i become less than i mean until i is less than 5 this code will keep running and running and running okay the moment i's value reach more than equal to 5 then this loop will stop so what will happen in the first loop it will be printing 0 second loop because after printing 0 it will increase by 1 and it will keep increasing and increasing till i's value become the 5 okay 
so just let's run it quickly and see see again for the while loop 0 1 2 3 4 5 till 5 it run so it's less than 5 so ultimately 5 uh, 5 times the loop run and it will stop executing so this is how you can utilize for loop as a while loop okay and after that let's come to infinite loop okay so infinite loop what kind of loops are infinite loop it will keep running and running and running till if you have a condition to stop it so for that example i have used a variable called j and we have uh, assigned the value as zero now in this for if you notice we are using for and we are not giving any conditions we are just saying for then the code block starting and i'm saying that if j's value is greater than 100 break the loop okay so if j value is greater than 100 then break the loop okay so it will stop the loop and after this condition okay after this if condition i'm printing format print so just keep printing the value of j and i'm increasing j's value j variable value by one so it's going to be increasing by one so it will keep running and running till j's value reach the 100 okay so let me quickly run it and show you let's run it and see it keep printing and printing and printing from say 0 1 2 3 4 5 and the moment j's value become 100 like more than 100 actually so then this so it's the moment j's value become 101 the loop is breaking at this point and this this loop is no more running it's stopping there okay this is how we can run infinite loop in go using for uh, for loop okay now let me show you how can use the for loop with the range so you see here num uh, which uh, i'm using as a slice okay so num is a slice by now you should know the difference in go against the array and uh, slice in array you should have a fixed number for a slice you don't give any fixed number okay so num now let me show you how to use for loop with the range and we can use this range for slices arrays map and strings as well okay so in this example i'm using nums as a slice you can you know by now you should understand that uh, in array you should have a fixed number in a go and for the slices you don't have any fixed number it's a dynamic kind of array okay so slice so num is a slice and in that slice we have integer type we have any number of item for example here we have one two three four five so now we'll be looping the each of the items so one two three four five we'll be looping the each of the items here and how can you do that using the for keyword then you are assigning the value of in index and value we are getting the value from the nums but we are using the special keyword here range so for index and value so items index and value uh, equals is getting the value from where from the nums using the keyword range and then it's looping through and it's, it's main uh, execution area so the whatever code you want to run for example here we are just simply printing index so it's in for example in zero index it's in the one index it's in the so always remember index start from zero for arrays and slices okay so zero index should be one one index should be two three uh two index it should be three like that okay so let me quickly run this code and then it will become clear to you guys so go run then for loop and see for the index value zero it's printed one so index is zero and the value is one index is one and the value is two index is two and the value is three uh index is three and value is four and index is uh four and the value is five this is how you can iterate through a loop through your slices arrays maps and strings now let me show you how can you loop with the range with the strings so for example here i have shown in the integers it will be the for the string okay here also it's same so index ruin value and using the range keyword and the string okay and you're just simply printing uh, the index and the character here okay so just simply just run it first to the screen and uh, run it see it's printed h e l l o and it's printed the index also this is converting the string into array and is printing here okay so this is these are the different ways you can utilize the for loop in go now let's learn about the 
function and packages so what are the functions in go a function in go is a block of code that performs a specific task it takes the input parameter and return one or more values let me show you examples and it will be much more clear to guys the function example will find in function underscore example dot go file so we'll go one by one and the very first one is actually simple function okay a basic function so basic function expect you the input parameters or input values and there you just uh, do your work do apply your business logic and whatever you do and just return them value okay so let's look at this one and in go to define a function you have to use a particular keyword called func so the word func that is represent function then the function name which is here add and after that inside the i mean opening closing of uh, the, the first brackets the parameter here only two parameter but you can add as many as parameter that you want or that your application require okay so func to declare a function then a variable name a function name called add then the opening and closing of the first bracket where you are specifying all the required input parameters and while defining the input parameters you also have to mention the data types of the input parameter for example x is integer and y is the integer and after closing of the first bracket you give a space and after then mention the written data type which is integer here and if you see what you're doing in the function so opening of the uh, code block and closing of the code block and inside that we are doing return x plus y so whatever value we receive as x and y we just we're just doing a sum and returning it okay that's what we're doing here so let's come down and see result is a variable equals add which is the function that you have defined here func add so func so add and you are passing two values x is 3 and y is 4 and if you to use that it will return what 3 plus 4 right and that data is actually getting stored in a result variable and you are simply just printing the result variable so just do it so go run and the functions example dot go and see it printed the result as 7 okay and this is the very 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 basic uh, function okay now let's make it more interesting let's try out the multiple return values now if you see here you are using a and b so you're using uh, two variables equals you're using swap so swap and then you're passing two values and the moment you're passing two values this function what is doing is swapping the value so a becomes the world and b becomes the hello how is happening let's see the function so in the func again how you define the function we are going to use the keyword called func f-u-n-c func keyword then the function name and after the function name you open close the first bracket inside that you mention the variable now if the variables or input parameter variables are same data type you just at the end mention what is the data type string okay and this is where you are also specifying the return data type which is string and string now remember here if it's just one value you're returning so one type is you can just mention the exact data type that you're returning into here for example here but if you're going to return multiple data or multiple values then in the return definition or return data type definition you have to give a again first bracket and then you mention what is the return data type or what is the data type that you're returning okay for example in this multiple return statement we are just returning return so first value is y that's coming as a y and second value is x so just returning two values okay on two variables okay that is the reason it's called multiple return values so that's why after from getting the values from the swap we just get uh, putting the value in a and b and you're printing as a and b so that's just put, uh, printing and it will become much more clear okay yeah you see the word was actually hello and world but what we did we just swap the values so swap function we just move that to y like y is value to the first 
and after that you are passing the x value so in the return statement we can pass on multiple return statement here right and it's printing that's why just swapped so a is world and b value is actually hello you know the function right what how it happens so this is how we can utilize the multiple return values so in this example let me show you how we can achieve the name return values so uh just look at the split function while i'm doing it so split it sum int so again to declare a function fun keyword the name of the function spill it and the input parameter we're expecting a sum in which is a data type is integer and return we're just giving x and y which is an integer now very important to look at in the return statement inside the function we are not giving any values but since we are defined here what is the return type it's automatically uh, getting that okay let's go back to the uh, function again so name return values sum is what 100 x and y are the variables equals to spill it and spill it is the function that you define here where you're expecting sum which is 100 x and y it has right and you have given the uh, intimation x and y uh, is the type is integer is returning so that's why the value coming to x and y again x and y are the new variables here okay and while printing you're saying the spillet of d that is the sum value is x is whatever we got from the x and y is whatever value we're getting is a y so important part again here we are not giving like here we have given the return statement as y x right but here we are not giving that you are just mentioning here is the x and y is the data of integer and is returning okay so whatever the variables you add here you can return all that just go down and just quickly run this and see it's giving 100 is the uh the total of 44 and 56 if we just run again same right so this is how you can achieve the name return values okay now the final function is the variadic functions what are those so here what are you doing we are just uh, doing sum of num so we are passing one four one two three four and this is how we are passing and just getting the sum of all this value nothing special the special part is actually in the function the sum of num here if you see that func which is how we define the function the name of the function this sum of num and you are passing one parameter input parameter and you are giving it a name as nums okay so nums so what is the nums so nums here we are giving the data should be integer so this this particular part okay this particular part specify that nums you're getting it becoming a array and in that you have the integers values okay and what is the return at a time it is giving integer. so whatever the sum value is returning okay so this part as an input parameter you are not specifying you just particular uh, variables the input parameter instead you're just saying that it will be all nums actually like whatever values as a number you pass that will be coming as an array here okay so after getting that you can just run a loop there so what you're doing here for whatever like underscore num here and then range num so from the nums is getting the range underscore and num we just want the like this is the index but we don't need the index but we just mean the main value so so inside that for loop we're just having we already have the total number right so total plus equals it's adding up the number every time it's looping so one two three four it all loop through this and it's just adding the value here in the total and you're returning the total that's what you're doing here so important part to notice here if you for example in some situation there will be many numbers of input uh, data and you're not sure how many data as input parameter you're getting okay in those cases you can have like this you can pass on like nums or say whatever variable name you need to use then three and dots uh, and then the data type of the particular values and then after getting the values so in that you can just loop through it okay so let's simply go down and run this code and see it's printing 10 so 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 which is 10 this is how we just simply achieve a dynamic of the input parameter we can achieve the dynamicity of the input parameter we're calling it as a variadic function so 
the input parameter can vary in that case how to handle the values this is how you can do achieve them here okay using vary functions now that you have covered the different kind of functions let's start learning about the packages and this is very very important so what exactly is package package in go are a way to organize and encapsulate the code each package can contain multiple go files and each file belong to one package that is very important to remember now how to create the package nothing special just at the very beginning of the file of the go script you have to say package and then the package name it will become a package and by the way using this logic if you come to any of the uh, you know go codes or go scripts see it's starting with package main that means this is the main package okay then let's come to the slide again now let's learn about a term called exported name okay so in go a name is exported if it's begin with a capital letter at the beginning okay for example for example if you see this particular example above punk area of circle that is actually a name that can be exported to other package if the package for example math and that out of that math package the function is uh, in the capital uh, the, the first letter is actually the capital letter then it will be exported and can be used by other packages other uh, go scripts okay and then importing packages so you can use the code from other packages by importing them and we'll cover all that shortly in packages you can develop custom packages as well suppose you have a custom package then math you can see uh, in here and uh, you just added one function called add uh, function func add and in add function you are expecting uh, two uh, particular uh, variable which is x and y and the data is integer and return is the integer and see you are doing the return x and y this is the same example that you use in the our uh, function learning part okay and then after uh, you know defining the uh, math package we can use this uh, in our main package for example package main then import fmt format is for printing the uh, things and then whatever the path of the math package is you just have to mention that and then we can utilize like math and since the first first letter of the function is the capital a that's why you can utilize that add and then you just pass in the values so this is how we can utilize the packages or custom packages now enough talk i should show you how to use the packages but before that before the demo part why you should be using packages so organizing code with packages become very easy packages are like great way to structure your go application and each package should have a single purpose for example a net that slash http package is standard library for using http request and responses then dependency management go modules are used for managing dependencies you can specify the libraries in your go mod file and go will handle the and so we'll we'll discuss about that after uh, covering the packages okay now let me show you a complete package example but before that let me show you the folder uh, structure so assumptions here that suppose you have a package named shapes and that provide functionality related to the geometric uh, shapes and have two files one file is called circle.go and second file is the square.go and then we have the main.go okay so in uh, and the folder structure we have a folder called shapes and uh, the um, circle is uh, circle.go and the square.go okay now let me show you how to build and use this package okay let's jump to the code so for this particular demo i have a particular folder called shapes okay and if you come to this shapes folder you see circle.go and there you see package so this is how you are specifying the name of the package that you'll be utilizing so package then shapes so name of the package shapes we are importing math here and then we are creating two function area of the circle and the diameter of the circle okay it can be any function but importantly see this area a part a is capital and in the d is like not capital so this function area of circle you can export and it can be used anywhere but remember this diameter of circle will be not be used importable and use other places that is a very big difference and then we have square.go 
so in square.go also if you see the package name is saved so for circle.go the package name is saves for square.go the package name is shapes only so whatever the files you create under the shapes package okay or shapes folder you should at the very top of the particular files call the package shapes so whatever files you create and if you add this at the beginning and the top it will become the part of the package okay and it can be utilized in or it can be imported and used in other uh, go scripts okay so and here also if you see that we are using area of square which is a is capital so it can be utilized in other places but if you see the um, perimeter of square it is the p is not in capital so it cannot be exported it cannot be utilized if it's imported other places okay now let me show you how you're utilizing that now there should be a file called package example dot go and see now how i'm using this uh, day two then slash shapes because uh, go dot mod file will come to the go module and go mod. Don't worry, we'll be we'll, we'll discussing that very depth. Just this part module day two. So this is how we can refer any other folders and file in our uh, go repo or the go source file if you just main, mention this in the go mod. So go mod I'm saying module day two. So in package example. This is our source code where we have the go mod go automatically will look in the day two, which is this current uh, go mod day two and this folder it will look for the shapes just like it's here. Okay, so day two shapes the day two is coming here because in the go mod I have mentioned module day two. I will show you how to configure and all this just for now. Remember for now just assume that this is how we define the path. So day two then shapes. And this is how we are importing the shapes package. And then in the main, we are just using radius 5.0 and area of circle, which is shapes area of circle. Okay. And uh, here we are passing the radius and we are just we are getting the area of circle. Then we have uh, sides uh, where we are just giving the uh, value 4.0 and area of square, which is shapes dot area of square so area of circle and area of square are actually two different um the, these two are function of the shapes package but in two difference in circle we have the area of uh, circle and in uh, square we have area uh, area of square and uh, there you see we are just from the single shapes we are importing we can use both the function very easily right now what and this is first let's just run this okay so go uh, run and the package example and it's printing the proper values now what if we try to run this uh, this diameter okay now remember this uh, this particular diameter uh, it's not actually uh, like it's it, this this particular function this see we're not uh, able to go inside so let's go uh, it's in the diameter of circle right so this let's go circle you see diameter of circle but it's not actually exported. It's the first letter of the uh, in the particular function name. It's not a capital letter. So if we try to run this, we'll definitely get an error here. See, undefined. The diameter of circle is undefined. But the moment we go and circle this, just make it a capital letter. Okay. Let's come here. And now let's run it. Let's make it the capital and if we just run it then it's working so this is how you can define a package you can create a package and you can utilize them now in this package part uh, i talked about this uh, this particular file called go mode right so now we are going to discuss about go dependency management how can we set up this go mod file and a lot more about that let's get started now let's understand go modules for dependency management so what exactly is go modules so go module is the official dependency management system in go and is introduced in version 1.11 it replaces the older go path based approach for managing dependencies and allows for more straightforward management of project dependencies and here's a breakdown how to understand and use go modules now the very first step is actually initializing the new module 
Now to start a new project in Go modules, you first initialize the module of course, and this is done using the go mod init command. And you can see the example exactly here. So go mod init, and then your github.com, uh, your username and pass your project. There's a standard form for our demo purpose. It's day two, right? So we'll use the day two. Let's do it. So we'll run. Let's clear the screen first. So we'll run go mod init then day two. And you know why? Because if you remember for our shapes package example, say so go and you use the day two shapes, right? So that's why you're using day two. But you can, of course, name your uh, go model any name. See, it's module. And the moment you run this command, go mod init day two, that is, uh, it's creating what? A file called go.mod. And the module name is becoming day two. And go also specify the version that is 1.214. That is the go version I'm using. And that go also track that here. Okay. And any external modules that you add is actually will get added in this particular file. And uh, there's a bit more. Let me uh, show you. Now let's learn a bit more about this go.mod file. Okay. So this go.mod file uh, is the heart of your module. And it defines the module path and list the specific version of other modular dependencies that your project requires. And here's the example that uh, what it might look like. So you can see here what it might look like. So module, then the module name for our use case, it was module, then the day two, then the go version 1.15. And for us, it was showing some other version. Uh, for example, our example, it was module day two and it's go 1.12.4. Now. Now, three things important here, module that specify the module path, go, specify the go language version, required, required list of each dependency along with version. For example, you can see it here, say uh, GitHub some dependency, then version 1.2.3, GitHub and other dependency like version uh, 1.1, whatever uh, that uh, module or library install. So you can see here, it specify the uh, package path and the version as well, okay? Now let's learn about how can you add the dependencies. So when you import packages from other module in your code and run your program by using maybe a go build or go test, go automatically add those dependencies to your go.mod file and download them. Alternatively, you can manually add the dependencies by editing uh, the go.mod file uh, or using the uh, go get command. For example, go get then github.com slash and dependencies so or whatever is the uh, path of that particular um, package is. So I will show you a quick example. Let me show you. So we'll use this uh, get command. So go get then github.com slash google.uid. So go get and this. Let's see, if you go to go mod file, it added as required then this particular version also, right? Just how it's uh, mentioned here. And it can also another file or go sum, which is maintaining the sum of the particular uh, kind of a integrated check is adding there, okay? And I have an example that utilizes this uh, particular uh, module that is UI library. So we can uh, use that one. It is, so you can see here, we're importing this particular package github.com uh, slash google.uid in vendor example.go. And uh, in the main, we are using ID, so I'm generating ID using the UID dot new uh, this particular function, and uh, just printing the ID. So just let's run it. So go run then this vendor example dot go and see it's printing a unique UID. Okay, so this is how you can utilize the. I mean, you can get it to so go get the external uh, dependency, and we can utilize it like this, like UID then the new method to get a unique ID and utilize that. Okay. So this is how we can add a dependency. Now let's learn about the go.sum file. So along with go.mod, go also maintain a go.sum file. And this file contains cryptographic checksum of the content of specific version of modules. It ensures the integrity and authenticity of your module dependencies. And let me show you if you go to code and if you go to this particular go.sum file, you see the model that you imported, this version and the checksum of that, okay? Now, 
uh, versioning. So Go module support semantic versioning or we call it SIMVer and a typical SIMVer looks like version than a major version than not minor version and not patch. For example, version 1.2.3 where one is the main version, dot two is the minor version and dot three means the patch version. So Go modules also support uh, version suffixes like beta or RC like that. Okay. Now how to upgrade and downgrade the dependencies. So you can upgrade or downgrade the dependencies using the go get command. Okay. And you just saw a few minutes back how to use the go get command. Now tidying your uh, module. So over time as dependencies added, removed or updated, your go.mod file might reference modules that are no longer required. And you can actually clean all that extra space and all that using the command called go mod tidy. Okay. Now let's learn about the vendoring dependencies. So although this is not required, still you can vendor your project dependencies, which means copying them into your project directory. And this creates a vendor directory in your project containing the source file of your dependencies. This can be particularly useful ensuring that your project is self-contained and not reliant on external sources for its dependencies. Very important. Okay. And for this, you have to run a command called go mod vendor. Let me show you quickly how it uh, works. So we have this particular file, right? Uh, vendor example.go. Here you are using the external dependency, right? So what you're going to do, we're going to run go mod then vendor. You see, after running that, it creates the vendor directory and it's create the uh, that whatever UID uh, that is uh, required, it have all the source code like that. That particular package also source is stored in the UID. This is how we can make sure self contain. And for example, I want to make a build out of it. So what we'll do, we'll run go, then uh, build, then this particular vendor example dot go and see. It created a binary called vendor underscore example. Now, if you want to just execute the binary, we will say then uh, dot slash then vendor the underscore example and see it worked exactly like that. Is it it? So that's it, guys. Thank you very much for staying like this long and watching this course completely. And by the way, our next day, which is day third, we'll be covering the advanced golang constructs just look at what are the things we're going to cover we'll learn about advanced go constructs so basically array slices and map will go very in depth the pointers and struct again will repeat and will go very in depth so that you don't have a single doubt on you and we'll go to interfaces we'll learn more about error handling and as i promised we'll learn concurrency from the very basics and will deeply understand the go routines and channels. I know how you felt while I like, going through this go routine and channel part. So I'm making sure that you understand it completely. I will not leave you without making you understand all this. Okay. Just prepare for the day three. And again, thank you very much for staying this long. I hope you enjoyed the session. And if you are new to my channel, please, please, please visit the channel and share this video with as many people possible. I want to make sure that everybody who are interested in uh, DevOps learn Go and do improve in their career as well. And if you find it useful, do like it, of course, and share with as many as people as possible. See you again in my day three video.